most of us live in a hard world. What I mean by that is we live in a durable environment and most of it's made of concrete. The world is concreted over the, such a way that the Romans, bless them, could never have imagined. Everywhere is concrete and steel in the cities, on the pavements, on the roads. I read in a, an article in Forbes magazine that China has poured more concrete in three years than the United States did from 1900 to 1999. And I thought this is rather incredible figure, but I've seen the uh, story which was published in 2014, confirmed in other places. Now think about that. Pouring more concrete in three years than in 100. Well, the reason for this is, of course, that China has had a late industrial development. It also has a massive population. It's interesting to note that concrete is rather destructive of the environment. That is, it generates uh, uh, carbon that, that goes into the atmosphere. And in fact, this global warming, the climate change that we're now living with, this was understood, the science of it was understood in the middle of the 1800s. So in some ways, there's nothing new in the world. When I speak about hollow ways, I'm speaking of an environment that precedes the era in which we now live. That is a, an environment which was soft, agricultural, and not durable. The sunken road is a feature of the Bocage landscape in northwestern France, in the Netherlands, uh, in Germany. And it it's ideal for the creation of trenches, which is what a sunken road is. And trenches were a familiar feature of warfare. If you go up into a plane or you send up a drone into Europe, uh, Great Britain, the United States, you will be able to see formations under the earth that escape you at ground level. It's very interesting to see the civilizations, the places, the villages, the towns that have been lost. This is especially true in Great Britain. A view from the air reveals cottages that have been lost, walls that have been lost, even fields that remain uh, visible with their furrows, gardens that were lost because uh, an aristocrat wanted to expand his or her garden and the villages were moved out. The landscape is a very interesting aspect of the earth. And for most centuries, it's the all that we had, but it is vulnerable and fragile enough to show the impression of feet. And this is how these sunken lanes were developed, mostly through uh, cattle being taken from one farm to the other, uh, of people passing, taking shortcuts through the fields, so on. The historian Eric Hob Hobsbawm, H-O-B-S-B-A-W-M, talks about the long 19th century. He takes it from 1889 to 1914. He calls it the long century because straddling as it does three centuries, that is, the 19th, the, eight, the 19th century, the 20th century. It embraces a time that we call generally the time of the end, which begins, as you know, from, 19, from 1899 and ends in 1914 and goes beyond. Eric Hosborn takes this view because he takes in the French Revolution and terminates with the First World War. The French Revolution from 1889 uh, to, uh, uh, to 1900 
to, 80, to, uh, eight, to 1900 was a period that rattled France tremendously and it led to the development of uh, the uh, rise of Napoleon. Now, the, Napoleon's position in the uh, in the in uh, the revolution led to his uh, parade across the human history. A parade on what is called the Napoleonic Wars. The Napoleonic Wars were really uh, fought in Europe by Napoleon, but they affected the North American continent. We can take, for example, the 60 year war, which was called, which was an extension of in the United States, the uh, American Indian Wars. The American Indian Wars and the Napoleonic Wars in North America became a very important uh, hist history for the world. The War of 1812 to 1814 was a period in which the United States got embroiled in not only its own country, but began to penetrate into Canada. The Canadian brethren will know about Laura Secord, the famous heroine who detected the invasion of Americans into Canada, who had tried to take Montreal and somewhat succeeded. In fact, the American uh, Revolution uh, in 1775 to 1776, before the revolution was made formal in the, in the Americas, the Americans tried to invade uh, Canada. Penetrating into Lower Canada, they tried to attract, attack Montreal. Now, some historians argue that it was a means of extending the reach of America into Canada. In other words, an imperial push. It did not succeed. I mention these things only because it ties in with the 1812 to 1814 war, which under Madison, President Madison, was attempted by the United States again to invade Canada. And Thomas Jefferson described this as a mere matter of marching. It did not turn out to be so easy as that. You had the Indians who were in Canada who formed an alliance with the British. And forming this alliance with the British, they managed to push the Americans back into the South. And that's when the British took Washington, burned the White House, invaded the uh, Congress and drove Americans out of their own city. Uh, I mentioned the sunken roads only because I'm interested particularly in discussing the trench warfare. Now trench warfare was a feature of the 1800s of the period that we are talking about. And this begins with the Crimean War. Trench warfare was used in the Crimean War, which took place between 18 53 and 1856. This is the period when Florence Nightingale did much of her work and lay, laid down many of the rules of modern nursing, which are followed today. The trench warfare of the Crimean War was followed by the American Civil War from 1861 to 1865. It's rather interesting because the Crimean War uh, was uh, generally a war that was fought between empires uh, between Russia and Britain. The American Civil War, which was uh, obviously a brother against brother war, was studied by military historians because the Americans were using railways and they were moving their soldiers around in a way that portended the change of warfare. And it was studied quite extensively by uh, foreigners, by military people around the world. And the American Civil War was one of the first wars to use 
civil war. The particular battle of Antietam, uh, also Fredericksburg, uh, both occurred in 1862. Fredericksburg was in December, but the one I'm interested in is Antietam uh, in 1861 in September. In this case, there was, uh, there was a battle between uh, A.P. Hill, who settled his troops into what was known as Sunken Lane. It was, in, in a way, a natural trench. And they settled in against, uh, on, a, uh, on a road which was a, a hard clay surface. But it was like a, what they would call a breastwork. It was up to the level of a man's chest, and the soldiers could secrete themselves behind the rim. They were being attacked by the Union soldiers under General French. This was one of the worst battles of the Civil War. It occurred in a place called Sharpsburg, farmers called Sharpsburg. And Hill had arranged his soldiers along this sunken road. The battle lasted for about four hours. The Union soldiers came over the hill, they were repulsed, came again, were repulsed again. And by the time the war was, the battle was finished after four hours, 5,500 men were dead. The name was changed of the lane to Bloody Lane to reflect the severe slaughter that took place in that area. Next war we're going to look at is the Franco-Prussian War. Again, a war in which trench warfare was used. The sappers were the ones who would usually, the sappers were called the men with shovels. They were the ones who uh, dug trenches. Originally, they were the mine layers and the mine excavators. So they would go ahead with the shovels and clear the ground of any impediment to attack. The sappers now use more sophisticated tools. But this was their job to do this. So they would dig trenches. They would dig deliberate trenches based on the principle that if you are low down, down below the level at which the enemy can see you, you have a better chance of shooting him. Franco-Prussian War was in 1870. This was a humiliation for France. Germany was consolidating under Bismarck. And Bismarck was looking, uh, looking for trouble. So he attacked the French. And this war was particularly interesting because it helped to consolidate the other German states and gave rise under Chancellor Bismarck to the uh, powerful Germany that emerged later on. We'll come to that. The Franco-Prussian War was followed by the Russo-Japan War in 1905. This is interesting because it's regarded as the first great war of the 20th century. Now, these, these benchmarks are important because you can see that if we go from 1889 to 1914, we are compiling quite a long list of warfare before we even get to the Great War. Then we come to the first World War, which was called originally the Great War. It wasn't called the First World War, obviously, until there came a bigger war in 1939 to 45. Now, in the First World War, there were 400 miles of trenches dug. I think about that. The Battle of the Somme, Verdun, all of these, the, these battles were brutal and the massacre of young men, the flower of Europe, the flower of Britain, it was astonishing. It changed the world as it was. It changed society. Uh, millions of men were killed and millions of women were left widowed. And millions of children were left fatherless. There had been nothing like it. So it is rightly deemed as the worst war of the up to date until we got to the Second World War. I'm not going to stray into that period of time. The Great War of the First World War 
was followed <clears throat> on the margins after it ended in 1918 by the worst pandemic, the Spanish flu. Spanish flu was not really from Spain at all. It, it emanated from an American military base in Kansas. When the Americans came into the war in 1917, uh, they brought the virus with them. And under the appalling conditions that the troops had to face in the trenches, it spread. By the time the war was over, the armistice was signed and all of the soldiers began to go home, come back to the States, returning for, to, for, to India, back to Britain, back into Europe. As they stopped off at each of the railway stations on the way home to meet their families, they carried the virus with them. The United States were particularly hard hit. In fact, there were two or three waves. People died by the hundreds of thousands. Uh, as then, uh, masks were used. There was a certain degree of social distancing. But you can see that the experience for the uh, soldiers from 1914 actually extended to 1920. We had entered now a period of the great time of trouble, uh, after which the world would never be the same again. Well, trench warfare then is uh, one of the worst and most impossible wars to wage. Essentially, it is essentially static and it requires uh, a kind of warfare that ludicrously involves men climbing over their trench and running forward under a hail of bullets and, and cannon fire. And so they were, the men were rightly seen as cannon fodder. It was a war that changed the world. It also the war that ended that period of the harvest and brought into the truth movement, the understanding that we have now, that the time of trouble began in a way that was plain and obvious. The question, of course, that we have to raise is that was then and this is now. But I'm going to go back a little further. We're going to go back now to another period when the world was different. We'll talk a little bit about the homesteading. That when the pioneers began to move across the Western Canadian landscape and across the Western American landscape, uh, they used the uh, Oregon Trail for the large part. The Oregon Trail ran for 2000 miles from Independence, Missouri to Oregon City in Oregon. You can imagine the difficulties that uh, these pioneers had. They were, they were immigrating from places that had probably become overcrowded, looking for something else. People always look for something else better than what they have when they either immigrate or emigrate. This movement of people uh, are along the, uh, uh, the uh, Oregon Trail uh, was quite a phenomenon. It's estimated that 400,000 pioneers moved across the Oregon Trail, stopping off at different places along the way. And interestingly, we have their feet marks uh, that are preserved in what is called the Deep Hill Ruts in a place called Guernsey in Oregon. In fact, if you go there, uh, you can see this is memorialized as a national monument, as one of the great uh, episodes in American history. Now we're going to talk a little bit about another Canadian. He's a, an educator and a hierarchyologist. <laughs> Try saying it fast. A hierarchyologist. His name is Lawrence J. Peter. Lawrence J. Peter uh, came up with what is called the Peter Principle. A Peter Principle essentially states that in a hierarchy, an institution or a company, that an employee will eventually rise to the highest level of incompetence, which means to say that one may be suitable in your own position, but you may then be promoted with all best intentions 
and find yourself in a position which you're not very competent at. Now, maybe some of us have found ourselves promoted. Peter, the Peter Principle argues that being promoted is not necessarily a good thing and that some people are better off where they are and that most of the work that's being done competently is either being done by leaving people where they are or it's being done by people who are competent. This is a famous principle that he came up with. It's more complicated than the one I've given you, but this is basically what it says. He goes on to say that in time, every post tends to be occupied by an employee who is incompetent to carry out its duties. That work is accomplished by those employees who have not yet reached their level of incompetence. Now, Lawrence J. Peter also said something else. He said that a rut was a grave with the ends knocked out. I'm going to use this as a metaphor for the Christian life. Now, if you're like me, brethren, you find yourself sometimes troubled by your faith, whether your faith is strong enough to accept that Christ loves you as much as he says he loves you. Well, what do you do when you are troubled by your sins, what I would call legacy sins or closet sins? What do we do when we have been converted, we've accepted Jesus as our savior, as our redeemer, and yet we cannot accept that we have been forgiven? This is not an unusual situation. You see, conversion is a wonderful thing. When we come into the truth, we are enthusiastic beyond degree. But what do we do when we settle into a rut? When our rut that we create is one of our own making. When we have trouble believing that our sins are forgiven. It's one thing to be forgiven in the first flush of conversion. But what do we do if we commit other sins? I suppose we live a long life and we continue to commit sins. Are the sins that we commit after we have been converted, after we have been forgiven, forgivable? Now this can lead to a period of depression and really uh, grind us down into what I would call the pit. Psalm 88, three and four mentions this. I'm going to read this. Psalm 88, three and four. I am overwhelmed with troubles and my life draws near to death. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like one without strength. What we have here is a soul that is racked with depression and doubts his, her, your, my ability to accept the forgiveness that the Lord has promised. This is an awful place for a Christian to be in. And this is like walking up and down in this rut. We, we are walking and we're making the rut deeper. It, it is a pressure upon the soul, upon the heart. It is an erosion of the spirit. It is like the animals and the people who dig a trench, a rut in the ground as they're going back and forth. It is an unpleasant, ugly place to find oneself. As the righteous, we sometimes behave unrighteously. If we are unrepentant for our sins, that's one thing. But suppose we are repentant and yet we doubt that we have been given forgiveness. Hebrews 12, 1, the apostle says, so we are to run the race, throwing off 
all impediments, so the Greek, throwing off all impediments and running the race casting aside the sins that in one translation, the King James besets us. And there's another translation, uh, a Greek interlinear, which refers to the popular sins. Now, I don't know how many sins are popular. What it means is comfortable. Sins that we may be comfortable with, that we don't pay sufficient attention to, uh, the sins that we have incorporated, let's say, into our personality, that we have become accustomed to the way we are and we accept them. There is a great variety of such sins. In fact, there's a, an almost countless variety of them. Is that what we do? Do you do it? Do I do it? Of course. The th problem is that if we find ourselves now in a rut that we can't get out of. And this rut grows deeper and deeper till we can't see over the sides. We find ourselves channeled into a place that we can't, can't climb out of uh, vertically and we have no destination horizontally. This is a bad way for a Christian to be in, but this is not an impossible state to find ourselves in. What we need to do is to accept that when the Lord Jesus says that he has forgiven us, that it is for all time. That the sins that we do commit are not of the sort that are going to alienate him from us. That is, he doesn't, he, he does not disown us. This is a very important point. Not being disowned by the, the Lord is the most important satisfaction and gratification that any Christian can have. Three scriptures I'd like to read to you. First one I'm going to read Psalm 32.5. Psalm 32, Psalm 32, verse 5. This is from the New International Version, but any version will do. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Notice that we do not cover up our sins. We acknowledge it and we do not cover up our iniquity. And I said, I'll confess it. Now, confession is good for the soul. It, is, it also results in the forgiveness that we get. Psalm 103 verses 11 and 12. Psalm 103, 11 and 12. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. The east and the west do not meet. And lastly, Isaiah 38, 17. Surely it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. In your love, you kept me from the pit of destruction. You have put all my sins behind your back. That's a very graphic uh, description. It was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. And you have put all my sins behind your back. Where have they, they have become invisible. 
No Christian then need suffer the agonies of alienation from the Heavenly Father when he is so ready to forgive us. If we're in a state of doubt and despair, despondency, and in the rut of despair, then we are unfree. Remember that if we have no past, we have no future. In fact, the future is intended to redeem our past. That is sanctification and justification. These are the gifts of, uh, of the Christian, the consecration, uh, the dedication of one's heart, mind and will is what the Lord loves about us because we have accepted unconditionally that we'll do what he wants us to do. Yes, we fail along the way, but we have to trust that since he knows where our weaknesses lie, that he will make the adjustments accordingly. So hang on to justification and don't let anyone take it away. There have been occasions in our movement when brother has been against brother, sister against sister. And, and this is not what the Lord wants. We have said in some instances that such and such a person who turns away from the faith, the official faith, the movement, that you've lost your justification. And this is, this is not possible and it's not true. So we should never find this kind of retaliation to have any weight with us. Our obligation is to love the brethren, not only as ourselves, but to be willing to give our lives for them, whoever they may be. This is what is incumbent upon us if we love the Lord as we profess to love him. Now, I'm going to add a little coda to my talk. I have a few minutes to do that. You'll remember that Brother Jolly in the 1970s went into great detail to talk about the quasi-elect. A quasi-elect mean those who appear to be, but not are actually, elect. But in the period of time that they have emerged, that is in the epiphany period, that they are the best elect class that is available for that period of time. But Brother Jolly did something very interesting. And this shows how progressive he was. He said of the quasi-elect that this is a class who is justified by faith, which is fair enough, but not only a class justified by faith, but that a class that even if it does not go on to consecration remains justified, but more importantly, that the justification is accorded to all those who take Christ. And the term he used was Christ as savior and king. This is very important. This is an important development in the epiphany of truth. And it's one that we ought to be, and perhaps are fully familiar with. But what this says to us brethren is that we have brethren and we have sisters who belong elsewhere than with us. That is to say that to believe in Christ as savior and king is sufficient. Whether you happen to be a Baptist, a Presbyterian, a Wesleyan. This is what Brother Jolly is saying. Let's take this one step further. The consecrated Epiphany campers are the consecrated people who inhabit the Epiphany camp. It doesn't, it includes you, includes me, but it doesn't include only you and me. 
And the work that needs to be done, as I see it, is to recognize the fact that we have brethren and sisters all over the place, some of whom will never ever become Epiphany brethren. They won't. We are a declining movement. You can see from the numbers that attend this gathering that we are small in numbers. We don't wish to get any smaller. It would be wonderful if we had a sudden influx of brethren falling all over themselves. That's not going to happen. It won't happen. Not every country is in the same predicament, but this one is. Britain is. Australia is. Now, we have the brethren in the Dawn Bible movement, but Dawn Bible students. We have truth brethren everywhere. These are all, as we regard them, our brethren are consecrated. In fact, we've worked, Brother Jolly worked closely with these brethren to publish, to print uh, some of the volumes that you and I study. They did that. Uh, this was, again, one of Brother Jolly's progressive tendencies to collaborate with brethren. And by collaborating with them, acknowledging that they were, in fact, brethren whom we should love and honour. As I see it, our obligation is uh, to love these brethren whom we may in fact never meet. Uh, I know some of these brethren myself. They go to other churches that I don't go to. But I know that from their disposition, from their frame of mind and from their dedication, let me put it this way. Why would somebody get up on a Sunday morning to go to church and sing about Jesus if it didn't, didn't mean anything to them? Why would, for instance, so many people now in Tokyo, which is a land, which is a city uh, uh, full of crosses on the rooftops, why would they want to get up early at five o'clock in the morning and sing hymns to Jesus? This is a very interesting phenomenon. It says a lot about the world that we're in. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to see that there is a lot of humanity in the world today, many of which is exercised by Christians. I, I know some of the healthcare workers who, who care for us, care for me, who in effect give their lives and are prepared to give their lives in order to save their patients. Now, this ability to have such so much compassion is part of the image of God. It's not a stretch of imagination to imagine that there will be Christians among them. So we need to recognize them as such, but we also have to realize that they do not believe as we believe. The epiphany truth, the truth, the harvest truth, is a wonderful, precious thing. In a way, we don't deserve it, but we have it. But for most of the, I'm going to say most of the quasi-elect, and most of the consecrated epiphany campers, we may never come across them. However, they may do a lot of the heavy lifting that we can't do because we don't have the numbers and we don't have the talent or the skill or the intellect. Many of them you will find will be occupied in, let's say, in fighting against uh, evolution, human evolution. Uh, there might be those who have particular insights on the changes in the world who stand up and like uh, John the Baptist argue against the perversity that is now invading uh, Europe, and the United States, North America, all over the world, in which marriage, which has been mutilated, in which uh, uh, perversity has become commonplace. But not everybody is like this. Not everybody does this. I think, I think what we need to do is make the message of the truth available in ways that will appeal to such people. But as I said, most of them will not accept the truth. And in fact, most of them 
uh, believe the Trinity. Now, Brother Frank alluded to this. The reformers, Wesley, Luther, uh, Melanchthon, they all believe the Trinity. Now, what do, what do we make of this? How is it possible? How is it possible to believe the Trinity, to go down on your knees before God and to think of him as three in one? Well, it would seem impossible to do it. But if we are going to wait for Christians to give up the Trinity, it's not going to happen. I think we need to be optimistic, take the view that whatever is going to come to us, however long this time of trouble, this long time of trouble, to have the faith that in due time, God will bring it about. He'll bring about the reconciliation of man with himself. And you may find that many of these consecrated Epiphany campers in other churches will be in the vanguard. There needs to be a class of brethren who will go over into the kingdom. It may be, and I hope that it will be some of us. I may not live long enough to see that, but we may find that other brethren who know enough, who are godly, consecrated, and lovers of Christ and lovers of God can do this. This is what we have to look forward to and pray for and keep ourselves very humble, keep ourselves open and interested and winsome to all those who come to us and look for what we have to offer and accept the fact without resentment that there will be those who are not against Jesus, but for him. And we may not rebuke them. We may not take this privilege from them. We may not take away their justification or minimize it because it's theirs, it belongs to them, and they deserve it because they have made Christ their savior as we have made Christ ours. I'll end there. God bless these words. Thank you. <laughs>